Hello, our names are Daniel Kim, Joshua Yoon, and Anthony Belladonna. This is our ARM processor project. Please note that most of our code was referenced from the textbook Digital Design and Computer Architecture, ARM Edition, by Sarah L. Harris and David Money Harris. There are three main types of ARM microarchitectures, single cycle, multi-cycle, and pipeline. Single cycle executes each instruction in one clock cycle and is relatively simple to implement, but is limited by the slowest instruction in a program and requires separate instruction and data memories, which is generally unrealistic. The multi-cycle microarchitecture executes an instruction in multiple cycles and requires only a single consolidated memory and reuses expensive hardware blocks to reduce cost. Pipeline microarchitecture executes multiple instructions at once, thus increasing throughput, but requires additional logic to handle the additional instructions. From a pedagogical standpoint, single cycle processes are the easiest to understand and implement. And thus the example code in the textbook is a single cycle processor. The basic structure of a single cycle processor includes two parts the data path and control unit. These two branches manifest as the ARM and data path blocks in the code, which will be explored later. The data path handles transfer of data through the registers and memory. Note that ARM is a 32-bit architecture, so all data and addresses have max of 32 bits. A control unit takes information from various instruction fields and directs the data through the different fu functional blocks. The program counter holds the address for the current and next instructions, with the addresses pointing to parts of instruction memory. The instruction memory holds all of the instructions that are being loaded into the register. In the case of this project, the instructions were loaded in from a .mem file. The register file contains the 16 registers that ARM uses to store commonly used variables and information like the program counter, stack pointer, arguments, etc. Note that A1, A2, and A3 hold addresses for the two source and destination registers. RD1 and RD2 hold the contents of the source registers, and WD3 is the content to be written into the destination register. Here's a table containing the registers in the register file. Note how different registers are specified for different uses. The ALU computes addition, subtraction, and, and or operations. Additionally, the ALU sets flags which are used for operations like conditional branching, if statements, loops, etc. Note that this fundamental block was left as an exercise in the, in the textbook code. So we wrote the ALU module. The data memory stores the data the program is operating on. Please note that the code written in the textbook was in system Verilog. And so we needed to translate the code to Verilog. Some changes included changing logic declarations to registers or wires and always FF blocks to always at blocks. The main functional block we needed to code was the ALU module. This is the schematic we used to make it, which was referenced from the textbook. Note that the ALU has one result and four flag outputs and is controlled by the control unit, which selects one of the operations to perform and sets flags based on the information received from the instruction. This is the code we wrote for the ALU. We will step through it now to give a sense of how we implemented circuit designs in Verilog. These two lines correspond to the elements on the right, um, which are the mux and adder that calculate sums and differences. Note how the ALU control from the control unit dictates, dictates which outputs are necessary. Also note that the ALU operates on two 32-bit signed integers and thus requires 32-bit adders and muxes, which we implemented here. 
and here. Next are the AND and OR functions, where we simply used the bitwise AND and OR commands built into Verilog. These operations, as the name implies, operate bit by bit on the 32-bit inputs and thus don't require any other special function to work. This case statement acts like a MUX that chooses which output to show depending on the control unit. The zero flag is set to one when all the bits of the output are zero. So we use an if statement to test for whether the binary number is equal to zero. And if it is, then we set the appropriate flag. The negative flag is simply the most significant bit of the result as this bit represents the sign. We used array indexing to achieve this. The carry flag is the carry out of the addition operation and is only set when the math operations occur and is thus ended with a signal from the control unit. The overflow flag details if overflow occurred in the addition operation and is also ended with a signal from the control unit. Next, we'll go over how we designed the program to show outputs using the I.O. on the FPGA board. This is the top function where we set most of the I.O. We program three ways to show functionality, showing the contents of the write data variable, which details what is being written into data memory, showing the contents of the registers, and showing the program counter. We first set a clock to 1 Hz using the following code. The way the code works is that it leverages the extremely fast 100 MHz clock already present on the FPGA, and every 50 million cycles, a separate variable is clocked. Note it is designed in such a way that the duty cycle is 50%. We wanted to be able to pause at any instruction in order to examine the contents of the registers between any clock cycle. We tied a variable toggle to a switch and anded it with this clock. Thus, whenever the switch is high, the clock is allowed to run. And if the switch is low, the clock stays low and the program pauses. This way, we can sift through the different registers at any specific instruction in the program. We then assigned a separate variable, clock output, and set that to the tog clock variable, then assigned an LED to the clock output variable in the constraints file. This way, we could make sure the clock is running and use it as a reference for changes in the other LEDs. The write data variable was shown in hardware by simply defining a separate variable as an output to the LEDs and setting the least significant bits of the write data variable equal to that separate output variable. The register content is a bit more tricky as the data is buried in the reg file function further down the hierarchy. In order to reach the data, we defined a four bit input variable, which represents the address of which register to choose, as well as a seven bit output, which will show seven bits of the register of our choosing. Notice how these variables are passed into the arm function, then into the data path function, then finally into the reg file function. In the reg file function, we used array indexing to set seven bits that we wanted from the register specified by the address equal to the output LEDs. Notice that the four input address bits were tied to switches, which will be shown later in the presentation. These are the in input instructions that we used in our test bench and hardware implementation. These instructions were pulled from the textbook. We will now give a brief overview of the information content of a data instruction as an example. Consider this first line as an example. The 32-bit instruction is broken up into six fields, condition, opcode, function, rn, rd, and source2 fields. The first four bits make up the condition field, which defines if the control unit needs to test for flags from the previous instruction. Note that this instruction is simply a subtraction and does not execute based on any previous flags, and thus is set to 1110 which corresponds to the unconditional flag. The opcode specifies what type of instruction is being passed to the control unit. In this case, we are dealing with a data processing instruction. So we have an opcode of 00. Note that memory instructions have opcode 01 and branch instructions have opcode 10. The function field is broken up into three subfields, I, command, and s. The i field is 1 when source 2 is an immediate 
or constant, something like the number 16. In this case, source 2 is a register, so we set it to 0. The S field is 1 when the instruction needs to set conditional flags, but is 0 in this case because we are not dealing with compare or other similar instruction types. The command field specifies to the control unit the type of data processing instruction. So in this case, this is 0010 in order to specify subtraction. RN represents the first source register, and in this case is R15, so it is set to 1111. RD represents the destination register, and in this case is R0, so it is set to 0000. Source 2 represents the second source, which in this case is R15. So it is set to 0000 1111. Note that this register is 12 bits, as immediates sometimes take the place of the register. This is the test bench code used for the simulation, and it is taken from the textbook, with a few syntax differences due to the change in language, that is, it was changed from system Verilog to Verilog. This test bench runs the program and checks if the last instruction is writing 7 into address 100, which is the last instruction in the input set. Now, note the highlighted portion in blue is the last instruction, and for the data address variable, the address is 2 to the 6th plus 2 to the 5th plus 2 to the 2nd is equal to 100. The write data variable has value 2 to the 2nd plus 2 to the 1st plus 2 to the 0th power is equal to 7, as expected, so the program works according to this test bench. This final slide shows the clock at the top oscillating. We will now show the results on the FPGA. This is the I.O. format for the write data example, as discussed previously. Note the location of the clock LED on the left the four output LEDs with the least significant bits of the write data variable on the right, as well as the reset button. So in the video, notice how the lights cycle through the expected values from the simulation, um, and the clock is ticking on the far left. This is the IO format for the register example. Notice the location of the clock LED on the left. And now we have seven output LEDs, which represent the contents of the chosen register. We have the toggle switch, which starts and stops the program on the bottom left. The four address bits that choose which register contents to display on the bottom right of the switches. And the reset button in the same place. So this video has the register address set to R2. Um, and is cycling through the instruction, in, the input instructions. And so notice how it's cycling between values of five and seven, um, which is, right, so it just turned five, yeah. And this is expected as seen here where R2 um, toggles between contents of five and seven. This is the program counter example with bits 12 to 6 showing on the LEDs, um, not the least significant bits. Um, this is because the program counter was not changing much for the lower values because it's in, being incremented by 4. But if you watch now, you'll see that the LEDs slowly tick up as the clock constantly runs. So ARM-based op Processors are still very popular. Some notable applications, including the new Apple M1 processor, um, which they use in their new refreshed MacBooks and Mac Mini, um, the Samsung Exynos processor, which is for their um, smartphones, um, and also the main processor for the Jetson Xavier NX um, is also ARM-based. And this device is kind of like a powerful Raspberry Pi that's optimized for ML applications. Thank you so much.